Welcome to the Fort Collins Book Fest, our five-year celebration. My name is Jennifer Barfield, and I'm coming to you live today from the Animal Reproduction and Biotechnology Laboratory at Colorado State University. I'm here to talk to you about bison, but before we get to that, I just want to tell you a little bit about the festival. It is a virtual celebration of books and brews, writings and riffs, food and thought, big science, and the great outdoors. And as always, we're celebrating the importance of literature, writing, books, and our libraries. You can check out the virtual program at www.focobookfest.org. We have book talks, discussions, panels, prose and poetry readings, and it's all free to you. So be sure to check it out. Encourage everyone you know to check it out as well. Um, before we get to uh, my talk today on bison, I just want to thank some of the generous sponsors that have made this possible. So today's event is produced by the Poudre River Public Library District in partnership with the CSU Morgan Library. Our presenting sponsor is the City of Fort Collins Fort Fund. Further support has been provided by Friends of the Poudre Library District, Friends of Morgan Library, the Lila B. Morgan Endowment Fund, the Downtown Development Authority, the Liggett, Johnson, and Goodman PC, Front Range Community College, Downtown Fort Collins Creative District, and Old Firehouse Books. Media partners are KUNC and 105.5 The Colorado Sound. And I'd like to give a special thanks to the Northern Colorado Writers for presenting all four of the writers' workshops. So thank you to all of them, and thank you to all of you for joining us today. Uh, so you might be wondering why I'm standing in a laboratory to talk to you about bison, uh, and specifically about our herd, the Laramie Foothills Conservation Bison Herd. And I hope that by the end of this session, the reason we're standing in this lab will be abundantly clear. Um, so with that, I would first like to take a few minutes to introduce you to the herd. My name is Jennifer Barfield. I'm an assistant professor in the College of Veterinary Medicine and Biomedical Sciences at Colorado State University. My specialty is in assisted reproductive technologies. We basically look at ways to get animals pregnant, to keep them pregnant, and make sure that they have healthy offspring. I am pretty passionate about bison. The Laramie Foothills herd was established five years ago. In fact, uh, they were released initially onto the prairie from this gate right behind me. And our goal with the herd was to create a conservation herd that could be used as a seed herd, which means we could take the animals, allow them to grow here, allow the herd to grow, and then move some of those animals to other conservation herds that may need or want their genetics. The reason that we used science and we got involved was because we were trying to preserve bison with Yellowstone genetics. And Yellowstone genetics are important for a variety of reasons, of one of which is that there's no evidence of bison in that area having bred with cattle in the past. But one of the issues with bison in the greater Yellowstone area is that they can have brucellosis, which is a bacterial disease. And um, it's very easy for that disease to be transmitted um, in a herd and so what we decided to do is that we wanted to preserve those genetics and we could do that using assisted reproductive technologies um, and really essentially creating offspring that had those Yellowstone genetics but didn't have the disease. So the animals that uh, were originally kind of the founders of the herd, there were 10 of them. Those 10 animals I personally got to know very well because I would see them on campus every day, we would work with them, you know, I watched them have calves, I watched them grow up actually in some cases. And so to see them out here on the prairie five years ago and to be able to open that gate to release them, you know, back onto a landscape where they just really truly belong was very rewarding. Well in five years we have gone from 10 animals, which we released initially, to over 100 animals. So I would say they're doing pretty well. <laughs> I will say that that growth from 10 to over 100 has not been uh, because of assisted reproductive technologies. Once they come out here, they've been breeding naturally. Um, so there's a lot of natural breeding going on, but we've also brought out some other animals to join the herd um, that have come through our program at Colorado State University. So 
natural breeding, a little bit of new additions to the herd, and all of that has combined to create the herd that we have now. There is often this misconception that bison are very friendly, but they have a, you know, a very specific personal bubble, if you want to call it that, where you know, if you do get too close to them, they can react in a way that could hurt you. And so we just really encourage people to not walk right up to the fence, especially if the bison are very close to the fence, but to give them a little bit of space, you're actually going to see them a lot better because if you get too close, sometimes they'll run away. When we initially put this herd out here, of course, there was a lot of emphasis put on the release and getting them here and opening the gate, and now they're here. Um, and I would say, looking back, I mean, that was just a prelude, right? I, at that point, that was when the work began. It's just making sure that they're, they're safe and they're healthy and they're growing and they're adapting. Um, and I think that you know, there'll always be some level of that, just checking in on them, making sure they're okay. Seeing all the different ways that this animal has impacted this area uh, is really rewarding, not just to me, but I think to our entire team who's made this possible. Welcome back to the lab. Uh, now you've had a chance to see the bison out on their home range. I mentioned in the video that I get to know them pretty intimately and today I'm going to show you just how early that relationship begins. So you're in my lab here at Colorado State University. It is an IVF lab and that stands for in vitro fertilization. So we create embryos in this lab and we provide um, we have done some technologies with the bison to help ensure that we have healthy offspring. And normally for talks, I stand in front of a screen and I show pictures, but given this new world we're living in today and all of our capabilities to go virtual, I thought what would be better than to just show you how I do some of these things live in the lab. So I think the first thing I'm gonna do is I'm gonna show you some pictures because while I can demonstrate a lot of things, uh, there are some things I just can't show you very well. So I'm gonna show you some pictures of how it all begins. So if you can see here on this screen, you see the ovaries. Of course, when we are making embryos, we need eggs and we need sperm. And these are some pictures of some ovaries uh, from uh, bison. And on each of these ovaries are uh, dozens of eggs that could potentially become embryos. And in the bottom right, you can see what the eggs look like when we take them out of the ovary. So that dark spot in the center, that's the egg itself, that's where the DNA and all of the machinery that's gonna be required to make the embryo is housed. And then of course, we need sperm. And um, these are the two essential components to what we do here in the lab. And so here, this picture you can see, an egg that is surrounded by sperm, and if all goes well, one lucky sperm will fertilize this egg. Now we can do all of this here in the laboratory, and I'm gonna show you now a video of an, an embryo growing. So all of this that you're gonna see occurring is happening after fertilization. And you're gonna see the embryo start to divide. And the time span of this video that you're looking at is about seven days. So this is really the first seven days of embryo development. And you can see that there are some cells that are dividing. And we do all of this here in the lab. We have specialized incubators where we have the conditions set up so that the embryos can grow um, and develop over these seven days in a condition that is as close as we can get as to what happens in the, the body of the female. So you can see it kind of stays at this early development with just a few cells, and you saw the screen jump there for just a second, and it's still sitting at just you know six or seven, maybe eight cells, and now what you're gonna see is an increase in cell division. And when the screen jumped, we basically just put that embryo into a new medium that is um, supportive of faster embryo growth. So what you're gonna see now are the cells start to divide, and you'll see that soon you won't be able to count them individually. You won't be able to count the cells one by one and they'll come together and they'll grow and they'll compact. And then you'll see that as a certain number of cells are there that the embryo will start to grow and expand. 
One of the things I want you to look at here is that clear coating on the outside of the embryo. So that's something that's called the zona pellucida. It's essentially a protective barrier that goes around the embryo while it develops in the uterus. And it's around the oocyte as well, but it remains in the uterus until a certain point. And after a certain point, the embryo will actually hatch out of that zona pellucida, very much like a chicken hatches out of an egg. So we have all hatched out of a shell at some point in our lives. And this is just an example of how a mammal does it. So you can see here the embryo is starting to grow. The dark spot is actually what will become the fetus, and the cells around the outside will become the placenta. And the video is going to stop here in just a second, where you'll see what an embryo looks like at about seven days of development. So that all happens here in our lab and in these incubators in this room. In fact, uh, that video was taken right here on this incubator behind me. Now, I mentioned that protective barrier, and that's really important for our work with the bison because it protects them from uh, the brucellosis, uh, the bacteria that causes brucellosis that I mentioned in the video. And one of the things that we can do is we can wash the embryos, and this is a technique that was developed for livestock uh, to ensure that diseases aren't passed on from animal to animal when we're doing embryo transfers. So embryo transfer is when you take an embryo from one female and you put it into another female. Now there are a lot of reasons why you might do this for commercial livestock. And in our case, the reason we do it for the bison is because we want to ensure that our offspring do not have brucellosis. So we take the embryo from one female at the stage at which you saw here at the end of that video. And then we can take it from the female that may have brucellosis and we can remove it from her uterus. And that is a very gentle procedure. The placenta hasn't been um, developed yet. So the embryo is still free floating in the uterus. And essentially what we do is we push fluid into the uterus and then we run it all out. And when it's in the uterus, we can kind of massage it and it, the embryo gets caught up in the fluid and we run the fluid out and we catch that fluid and we run it through a filter. So that's one way we can collect the embryos and wash them and then we can put them into a female. So the other way we can do it, of course, is if we have ovaries like I showed you, and we can collect the eggs directly from the ovaries, and then we do the fertilization right here in the laboratory and grow it for those seven days. So those are the two ways that we can generate embryos. But regardless, when we're working with bison, we always wash the embryos. So what I'm gonna show you here, I have a microscope, and you're gonna be able to see a little bit of what I'm doing. But the wash technique really involves moving the embryo through a series of drops uh, so that we can clean and make sure that the bacteria is not being transferred from drop to drop. We culture the fluid that is around the embryo in these washes and we test it to be sure that there are no bacteria that cause the disease in the drops. And we also test all of our culture media in the incubators to make sure that our embryos are clean and healthy. So here, if we look through the microscope, you can see that there is a drop of fluid, and I'm just gonna do this, and I'm gonna pick up a little, I'm gonna pick up an embryo. I'm gonna show it to you here in just a second. All right. So I'm gonna bring an embryo here into view. So here you can see in the middle of our screen, one embryo and we're just gonna simulate as if we're washing it. Okay, so I've picked it up out of this dish. And I'm gonna put it in a drop and I'm gonna back out here so you can kind of see the droplet. And I'm gonna put it in this drop. And then essentially I'm just gonna wash it through. I'll pick it back up in a very small amount of fluid and I'll put it in the next drop. Okay, and then I pick it up again and I put it in this drop and it kind of rinse it around. So no little brushes involved, of course, no embryo scrubbing necessary. And we do this up to 10 times. Okay, so here you can see our embryo. And theoretically, at this point, we could consider it clean or uh, we can ensure that there's no bacteria stuck to the outside of it. 
because the first drop of this is going to have an enzyme called trypsin, which helps us to make sure that there are no bacteria stuck to the outside of that embryo. So at this point, uh, we have a cleaned embryo. So what do we do then? We have two options. It depends on when we're making the embryos, and um, we can either transfer those embryos right away, or we can potentially freeze them. And it would be great if we could transfer all of our embryos fresh, but a lot of times when we have access to the very valuable animals uh, from Yellowstone, when we have access to their genetics, it's not in the breeding season, so it tends to be in the winter. Now the breeding season for bison is in July, August, September, so we've just passed through breeding season. Um, and that's when you want to put your embryos into your females. So sometimes, if we're not doing this during the breeding season, we have to hold the embryos. And to do that, we put them really in a state of suspended animation. And we can do that by freezing them. Um, we, can, we can do what we call a slow freeze protocol. And um, that is done in these very small straws. So you can see here, there's a little tiny straw. And we can put the embryo in this and put it into a machine that will freeze it very slowly. And then we will store it in liquid nitrogen. Or, alternatively, we can vitrify it. <clears throat> and for vitrification, this is a little bit different. It is an ultra-rapid uh, technique that instead of causing embryos to be encased in um, ice crystals, instead we do everything so quickly that the solutions and any fluid that might be in and around the embryo turn to glass. So what I thought would be fun to try today, and we'll see how this goes live, is that I would show you how this vitrification process is done. So first what I will do is I will be working under the microscope to put an embryo on a device, um, a vitrification device. And these devices are very, very small. I'm just going to put the lid right here. And I know you can't really see this here, but you'll see it under the scope in just a second. But it's a really, really thin film. And this is a device that's used um, to vitrify. Actually, they're used a lot in human infertility clinics to preserve embryos and oocytes for women um, and couples going through fertility treatments. And we're using it for the bison as well. So what I'm going to show you is just how you put an embryo onto one of these cryotops. OK? So let's go back to our embryo in our drop. And I am just going to prepare here, change my tip on my pipette. OK, so here we go. We're going to take this embryo, and I like to use just a very, very small amount of fluid. Small amounts of fluid are best because they make the vitrification process very quick. So you can see here. Oops. There we go. We've got the embryo on the cryotop. You can see that. It's very, very delicate. Okay, so you can see it here. It's such a small, small volume of fluid. And once we get it on this cryotop, we are going to put it into liquid nitrogen. So what I have here is a bath of liquid nitrogen. And you just plunge it in. You hear that sizzle? So hopefully you heard it, and that is really the embryo and all of the fluid around it turning to glass. So liquid nitrogen is incredibly cold. It's 196 degrees below zero in Celsius, which is, I think, 320 degrees below zero in Fahrenheit. So this is super, super cold. In fact, my, my fingers are actually getting a little bit cold right now. So once we get our embryos into this, you can see here, I'm just going to put the lid on this. It's very fine. And then we drop it right down into the liquid nitrogen, and it can stay there for a very long time, actually. So embryos can be stored in liquid nitrogen, whether they're frozen by a slow method or by vitrification for hundreds, potentially thousands of years. So they're really in a state of suspended animation. Now, once we get them to this point, we do then um, store them in tanks with liquid nitrogen. So what you see here is a liquid nitrogen tank. And in it, we have a variety of these canisters where we house 
these embryos on straws and other devices that can be, like I said, stored for a really long time. And we have tons of these tanks out here at the Animal Reproduction Lab. In fact, we have one that's, you know, uh, you know, 20, 30 times bigger than this one, where we store all of the embryos that we create um, from the bison that have Yellowstone genetics and other really valuable animals. So we have this really valuable bank of embryos that we can then use to help seed our herd. And um, that's one of the things that we've done to help maintain and increase the genetic diversity of our bison in our, our herd. So you'll see if you are lucky enough to be able to read some of the ear tags of the bison out at Simpson Prairie Natural Area in Red Mountain Open Space, um, you'll see that some of their tags say AI and then a number, and that stands for artificial insemination. So those were animals that um, we did the insemination of the female to produce that animal. And then there are others that say art, um, and that means that that was an embryo. That female, um, we have some females out there that were embryo transfer females, that she was created by us moving the embryo from one female to another. So not all of our bison in our herd have been produced that way, but many have, and um, you can note that by their ear tags. Okay, so what happens next? We have these embryos in this tank, and we, we're just waiting for breeding season to come around. So what happens then? Well, we have a thawing procedure that we use. So we can take these embryos out of the liquid nitrogen. And we have very set protocols for that. Um, I'm not gonna demonstrate that to you today because in all honesty, it's just us kind of pulling it out and moving them through drops kind of in the same way that I've shown you for cleaning, uh, but the different solutions help to ease them out of that frozen or vitrified state. But once we do get them out, if they're not already in a straw, we do put them in a straw. And that straw gets loaded into what we call an embryo transfer gun. And it's called a gun, but it is really just like a very, very long pipette. So essentially, it's a plunger. And the straw is inside this column towards the end here. And once we get that loaded, we take it out to where we have our females and we use a handling chute or facility um, similar to what is used with cattle, but maybe a little bit more robust. Bison are pretty strong um, and the females are awake. It's not a surgical procedure. And in most cases, it can be done in a matter of minutes. We give the female a, a little bit of an epidural so she's comfortable, so she doesn't really feel anything. She just stands there for a moment. And this gun gets passed through the vagina through the cervix and into the uterus and then once we get it into the right place we push the plunger just like that and the embryo comes out of the tip of this device and it's in the uterus and if all goes well we have an embryo that implants into the uterus and nine months later we have a calf so that is how we make these offspring really um, so you can see we have um, all of the uh, equipment that you would see in a lab that creates embryos and for other animals or even humans. A lot of the equipment is the same and the procedures are the same, but we have tried to adapt those or we have adapted those procedures to be able to produce bison embryos and healthy bison calves. So the way we do it now is we work with the animals here on the Foothills campus and then once the mother and the offspring that are born here, um, we've tested them, we make sure they're healthy, then we can reintroduce, or we can reintroduce them to the herd um, up at Sipston Prairie Natural Area in Red Mountain open space. So I think um, as far as, you know, just kind of the basics, you've seen a lot of the basics, you've seen how the embryo develops, you've seen how we clean the embryos, or at least the simulation of that. Uh, you've seen me turn an embryo into glass. That embryo is still sitting in this tank here. And um, so you've seen the basics, and now you even know how we get the embryos into uh, the female. So for our herd, really, the importance of this, we wanted to help preserve the Yellowstone genetics, which, um, as I mentioned in the video, is really important um, genetically because there's no evidence that they've been bred with cattle. 
um, but they're also culturally important to Native American tribes who, um, you know, sustained their livelihoods and their lifestyles off of this animal in that area. And, you know, our goal with our herd was to be a seed herd, which means, of course, that we want to give our animals to other herds and send them out. And um, so we're going to continue to do this work to capture the Yellowstone genetics that might be lost potentially otherwise and to inf kind of um, uh, get those genetics into our herd but also into other herds. So we have a lot of um, in, uh, transfers of animals go coming up to other herds, which is really exciting. And, you know, we're coming up on the five-year anniversary of the herd, which started really um, with this collaboration between the science here to ensure that we were putting healthy animals back on the landscape um, with, of course, the city of Fort Collins and Larimer County, who have allowed us to let the bison roam on the land. And so while they're both on Red Mountain Open Space and Soapstone Prairie Natural Area, um, you can see them from Soapstone Prairie only at this time. Um, but it's been really an amazing collaboration and we're starting to see how, um, what the impact of that really is. And there have been quite a bit of um, uh, interest in the, from the community, which we're super excited about because you know, I kind of think about this herd as, as, as our herd, as, as the herd here that, you know, we can all connect to and see and relate to. And of course, for me, I get to see them and to meet them, I guess you could say, from the time that they're embryos and just a few cells. And I've had the pleasure to be able to watch, you know, get the embryos into the females, do the ultrasound, see them in utero and see them born, and then eventually get to release them up on the prairie. And for our team and all of the folks who've made that happen, it's been very, very rewarding. Um, I think that, you know, in five years, coming to the point where we're now really able to give bison to other herds in significant numbers, which is where we're going in our next steps, is super exciting. And it makes not just the local impact, um, you know, which is very important, but we're able to have a much broader impact um, across, uh, across North America, potentially. I mean, we've sent bison already to Minnesota uh, and Illinois and Chicago, and Chicago, Illinois, and outside of Chicago, and then California and New Mexico, and we have some other transfers coming up, which we're really excited about. Um, I think that, you know, probably, um, well, one of the ways that we're continuing to do research is we're going to continue to improve our methods of producing embryos. That's our goal here in the lab. But we're also, you know, managing the animals on the landscape. There's research that's going on about how the bison are impacting the prairie itself. So looking at the grasses and the small mammals and the bird populations and um, there's some really great work out of the Warner College uh, that's been done on our herd and the reintroduction, which um, you know, we'll continue to monitor and look at. So it's been a very, very exciting project. And uh, I, I think that you know, as we move forward and we continue to perfect these technologies, it will just um, provide us really kind of a safety net also for the bison. Um, we can use it to infuse genetics into our herd, but we also have this huge bank of embryos that sit in these tanks. And, you know, if they're there for a hundred years or a thousand years, they really serve as an insurance policy. If something were to ever happen to bison, say another disease came through that was devastating to the population, we have all these embryos that could potentially help revive the population um, and preserve the genetic diversity that we have today. So. There are a lot of applications, um, even just beyond what we have done here in northern Colorado uh, to establish the Laramie Foothills herd. And um, I personally am incredibly proud of what we've done in just five years. I hope that you all can get a chance to go up there and see them. It's just quite a sight um, to see a hundred plus bison on the landscape up against the foothills. Um, and on a clear day, you can see snow-capped mountains in the back. And uh, it just feels right. So I hope that you can get up there to see them. Um, you know, I want to, of course, not acknowledge our partners in all of this. And um, let's do you some know, questions first, and then save that. Sure, we can do some questions That's first. Cool. If there are some questions coming in, I'm happy to answer them. Um, yeah. 
So well, we, we do have some questions coming in. Great, great. So I'm gonna, some of these you've touched on. Okay. But I'm gonna ask them and you can kind of elaborate. But we'll start okay. with a really simple one. Okay. How did you get interested in bison <laughs> and restoring the species? Where did that come from for you? Yeah, for me, I, um, I have always loved animals. And I think for a long time, I considered becoming a veterinarian. And I, um, I've, when I was in college and I was going down that path of veterinary medicine, I really discovered that my love was focused in reproduction and helping animals reproduce. And gosh, who doesn't love a baby animal? But I really became fascinated with what happens before birth. And um, so when I came out here to Colorado, I had actually never seen a bison before. And I happened to see one um, when I was driving on the highway one day. And I had been studying embryos and um, things like that with cattle and other large animals. And I just thought, gosh, I wonder if anyone's done this with bison. And I was really fortunate to meet some folks who, were, who had been studying bison from Yellowstone. And we realized that there were some applications for the skills that I had that could potentially help the bison. And that's kind of where it all sparked. And we had some great success up front. And I've just, you know, I think at first it was this scientific endeavor. And then as I got to know the animals, and then I got to know the people who were impacted by this animal, uh, it really just became an all-encompassing -encomp passion for me. Cool. So a question from Facebook is, and you touched a little bit on some of the other projects that are going on in other places for, for yeah. bison, you know, for these bison herds. But can you tell a little more, like, why is it important to restore herds to other parts of the West? And are sure. you working with native tribes as part of that process? Yeah, I, I mean, restoring bison to the prairie, uh, it, has, it has so many benefits. I, I've often heard people refer to bison as the gardeners of the prairie. And in many places, you know, their movements across the landscape would help seed new grasses. And they're, um, they're a keystone species. So a lot of other species depend on them. And if we want to um, maintain or repair the ecosystem, bison are a great way to do that on prairies where maybe a large grazer hasn't been for a while. Um, we work uh, with Native American communities as much as we can. Um, we do take um, requests from them for bison, and we have contributed bison to some partners who are working with Native American tribes to rebuild their herds or even establish new herds and bring them back to their lands. And so we really, um, it's really important to us in, to support those types of efforts um, and to be a collaborator where we can with those tribes. And we, we've given a couple of bulls to the Pueblo, Pueblo of Puaque in New Mexico, and those two bulls are still down there. We actually sent two bulls to the Oakland Zoo that is partnering with the Blackfeet Nation. And so the offspring from those animals will go back to the Blackfeet, and then eventually those bulls will get transferred to their lands where they'll roam and, and live their lives. Um, and so we are always looking for opportunities to support that community and to work with, with Native Americans. And, yep. Awesome. You touched a little bit on, because this kind of dovetails into that question, the first part of that question, you touched a little bit on the, the impact mm -hmm. that's being like Warner's doing some research and things like the impact on the prairie ecosystem. Yeah. Can you expand a little bit more? Is there any kind of, I know that's not your specific area, but do you know of any like really significant findings or kind of where the research is on what that impact is right now? Yeah. So, you know, I think, you know, with our herd, we started with 10 and we put them on a thousand acres. So. I think the impact is very hard to measure in the first years. There has been some um, data that's come out that's shown some changes in how some of the larger mammals move across the landscape, su or suggesting that there are changes, um, and looking at some of the different bird species, and there's some changes in the bird species that they're detecting, but it's very early on. A lot of these changes take years to um, appreciate and to be able to really document well and to say, yes, there's definitely a change. Um, and because our herd has grown so rapidly, I would imagine that now that we have 100 animals in the landscape, we may be able to see some of those impacts um, more quickly and they'll, see, they'll be more obvious. So stay tuned for that. There is some preliminary data. Kate Wilkins is a PhD student who did that work. And if you uh, want to read the, the article, there is a publication out there on it. So Kate Wilkins and Liba Pechar out of the Warner College worked on that. Um, here's a question from Anne from Facebook. She hey. wants to know a little more about brucellosis and sure. the Yellowstone herd and kind of that whole piece of the puzzle. Sure. Um, so, you know, uh, it's, it's no secret that the bison in the greater Yellowstone area and in the park itself 
they um, have brucellosis. Many of them do, not all of them do. Um, and brucellosis is transmitted uh, when um, animals come in contact with potentially aborted fetuses, which is um, a side effect or kind of what happens when the animal has the disease. So females that are infected will abort their calves either late in gestation or they'll have just stillborn calves. Um, and so bison are very curious animals. When other members of the herd come up and sniff or lick that fetus, they can um, acquire the disease or you know, get the bacteria in them. And that's not just limited to bison, other animals can, um, can get it as well from, from those fetuses. And so um, it can be easily transmitted that way. Of course, this happens at very specific times of year and um, there have been measures put in place to try to control transmission in the area because if it were to get into the livestock, um, particularly cattle, it could be really devastating for um, the cattle populations and the cattle managers and ranchers. Um, you know, but it's, I think it's worth noting that bison have never been, uh, it's never been documented that bison have given brucellosis to cattle uh, in and around the greater Yellowstone area. All of the infections that we know of have been traced back to elk. So it's a really, it is a dynamic situation and there are no quick and easy answers for controlling brucellosis and um, managing wildlife populations alongside of the livestock. So um, we could probably talk about that all day and the potentials there, but um, it's a it's a it's a very dynamic and interesting situation. So. Awesome. What would you say your biggest challenge has been in your effort to build a heart? Like, what's been the biggest that thing that's really that you struggled the most with? Oh man, the biggest challenge. You know, I think. Uh, gosh, we have had. M maybe it's just fortunate. Good luck. I'm going to knock on wood here. Um, that, you know, a lot of the work that we have done, we've had success very early on, um, you know, there are times where, you know, we don't make the embryos that we want to make, or we don't get as many as we think we're going to get, or, um, you know, we put embryos in females and they don't get pregnant, or, you know, they're pregnant and then they potentially lose their pregnancies. And, you know, those things are, are difficult, they're challenging uh, for the team when we, you know, when we see a pregnancy, we're expecting a baby and then we potentially don't get it. Um, those things can be challenging, but we understand that that that's going to happen sometimes and that's part of the process. Um, you know, from a, a, a management standpoint, I think the animals have done incredibly well out on the prairie. So we have been really fortunate that that hasn't presented us with a lot of challenges and um, that they've that that landscape was just ready for them. I, I think it, you know, it was there, it was ready, they're, they were grow, they're growing on it, they're healthy. We have animals that are having calves, very young, um, which is a good sign for animal health. Uh, so we've been really fortunate to not have a lot of major obstacles and we've had great collaborators, just the team itself with the city and the county and even the USDA, APHIS group um, initially, um, they really made it easy and we set things up I think really well and we worked with the communities on the ground the ranchers in the area we let them know what we were doing and kind of tried to be really transparent about our process what we were going to do how we were going to manage the animals and I think that's really made it so that we have had an easy go of it respectively and I hope that's not jinxing myself but we are producing calves like crazy we I think we had 30 this year which is amazing okay. yeah um. So do you think that this same sort of IVF approach that you're doing, would it work with other endangered herd animals? Do you know of anyone else out in the world doing similar stuff with other animals? Do you have interest in doing this with another species? <laughs> sure. Like, how does this tech, you know, this science translate elsewhere? Yeah, I think that these types of technologies um, do have applicability, applicability to a lot of different species. Um, you know, for bison, it's relevant because of the disease challenge. And that might be relevant to other species out there. I know um, someone had contacted me at one point about tuberculosis in Cape Buffalo. And we talked about our process. And I think there are some applica applications out there for that. Um, you know, I think just from a biobanking standpoint for a lot of endangered species, there are a lot of great institutions out there that are doing work to preserve eggs, sperm, embryos from endangered species to have that safety net, that insurance policy for those species as well. 
some of the big zoos, the Smithsonian, the San Diego's, Cincinnati, um, White Oak Conservation Center, a lot of these folks, that's not all of them, but there are a lot of really good groups out there doing work to help preserve endangered species in every way possible using every tool we have. Um, and so we are definitely not alone in applying these types of technologies to, um, to wildlife species. Um, Sue Ellen on Facebook wants to know, what are some of the other species that depend on the bison? Well, there are um, a variety of bird species that um, you know will will rely on them. Um, just from uh, you know the gardening aspect that I mentioned earlier, with their turn their hooves turning seeds into the ground. I mean, any grazer that's going to pass through that area uh, can benefit from the bison being there. And in in our area, that would include pronghorn. Uh, mule deer, elk pass through there, so a lot of those grazers could also benefit from the bison being on the prairie. Um, it's really, uh, once you get them there, you just kind of see how they all interact. I've seen coyotes out there, which actually they don't tend to bother the bison. I think they just recognize that the bison is a bit too big of an adversary for them. Um, but yeah, so I think there are a lot of other animals. And then when bison, um, you know, die, on the prairie, there are a lot of animals that feed off of them, including um, the coyotes and some of the bigger raptors. We've seen golden eagles uh, out at Soapstone Prairie Natural Area in Red Mountain Open Space. So there are a lot of animals that benefit from the bison being on prairie. Can you um, just, and you might have mentioned this, but can you touch back on how big is the Soapstone? Like how many acres is the Soapstone Prairie? And what's the ideal number of bison? Like What's the goal for a herd there before you'd have to think about putting them somewhere else? Yeah, that's a great point because our herd, of course, I'm talking about moving animals out. We have a little over 100 right now. Um, while Substrum Prairie and Red Mountain Open Space are, you know, 20-some thousand acres each, um, we have the bison on just a little bit under 3,000 acres. And we are trying to work in collaboration with the city and the county to manage the range so that at least half of the forage is left for other wildlife species. So we have kind of said we want to try to stick to around 100 animals for, for that purpose. So, you know, you're going to see if you are an avid follower of our herd, you're going to see that some of the animals will be leaving soon and going other places. Uh, but, you know, if we continue to have 30 calves every year, it's not going to be a problem to kind of maintain that and then, you know, send those animals elsewhere. So right now for our herd, we're targeting at around 100 animals with fluctuations given, you know, based on drought conditions and the forage availability uh, up there. So that's how we're doing it. It seems like nobody has been untouched by the effects of 2020, the pandemic and everything that we've been dealing with. Of course, Colorado, we've got wildfires on top of that. How has like the pandemic specifically, but even just the challenges of 2020 as a whole, how has that affected your work or, or has it affected it at all? Yeah, you know, so for our research here in the lab, we were really fortunate because we had just finished our annual collections. Um, with uh, collecting some of the ovaries and oocytes from Yellowstone bison right kind of when things broke in March. And so we were able still in 2020 to preserve hundreds of embryos from that population. So, you know, that was great from our research standpoint as we move into um, the breeding season, we are kind of shifting off some of the work on campus to kind of, you know, maintain our, um, lower levels of activity and social distancing and to ensure we can do all that. So there's been some challenges there. On the prairie, the bison have no idea <laughs> that there is a pandemic going on. They're just kind of life is normal, grazing, growing, reproducing, doing all the things that they should. Um, and I, I think, you know, from what I've experienced, there have been a lot of folks who have taken their social distancing up to Soapstone Prairie Natural Area where they can see the bison and go out on the trails. It's great for mountain biking and hiking and riding horses and all of that. You know, there's tons of trails up there for that. So uh, if anything, we have seen more visitation out to the property uh, where the bison are. Um, but yeah, they're doing great. They have no idea. <laughs> um, Kit on Facebook wants to know, what was your biggest sort of aha moment? What was the most, what's been the most significant finding over the course of your mm. research that you're like, whoa, this was really cool. What was that big moment? <laughs> I think I think nothing can beat your first positive pregnancy. You know, when you have that ultrasound probe and you're looking at the screen and you see that first heartbeat, 
uh, I think that for me was just like, oh my gosh, this works. <laughs> we, we can do this. It can actually work. So um, that was a really memorable moment for me. And in fact, we took a picture of the screen and I, um, um, one of my colleagues framed it for me and I have it hanging on the wall in my office. I think that was a, a really big moment, uh, you know, just from seeing all the cells and the embryos that we work here on the bench, you know, with and, and then to see the heartbeat and then of course to see that offspring born, which by the way, that, that offspring was born at the Bronx Zoo in New York. I forgot to mention that we have a bison there. It was our first embryo transfer a calf and we shipped the pregnant mother from Fort Collins to the Bronx Zoo and she delivered that calf there and he is still there and he is breeding with bison that were sent to the Bronx Zoo uh, from Fort Peck. And so they are part of a project um, with Fort Peck. So uh, yeah, I, I think that was probably one of the most exciting moments, that kind of aha, oh my gosh, this is happening <laughs> moment. Um, because this is a book festival, <laughs> what are you reading right now? What, what are you into uh, on the literary side? <laughs> Not, you know, fiction, nonfiction, whatever. What, is there something that you're excited that you're reading right, right now? Oh man, okay, so I am reading right now the Beauty and Breaking, actually. And uh, the author, her name is escaping me at the moment, uh, but it's a story about an ER doctor who um, talks about how her profession has helped heal her throughout her life. Um, and so that's really, um, really interesting, all the different dynamics there, especially as I think about COVID and how our first responders and our, you know, the folks who work in the hospitals are dealing with it. So that um, I am currently reading. I will say I have found a lot of really insightful things from braiding sweetgrass. Uh, and I've kind of read that chapter by chapter. There, there's a really great chapter on gratitude that really touched me, especially when in these times when things seem so turbulent and unpredictable. Um, it provides, it's written by a woman who is, is Native American, but is also a scientist. And so she inter, kind of interweaves these ideas from her culture with her scientific knowledge to produce these really insightful chapters on just nature and the environment and how those things come together. So that's a beautiful book um, that I would recommend as well. Nice. Um, well, here's another question that might dovetail nicely into talking about some of your partners, because the question is, how have you gained support for this project? You know, what, what have you done to kind of get support to be able to do what you're doing? And if there are people out there who yeah. want to support your work or want to be, you know, involved or support it in any way, what, what avenues exist for that? Sure. So, you know, a lot of the work that we've done and the support we have had has come through the community. So we have, you know, the city and the county are partners on the project and they have provided a lot of the infrastructure and support from a day to day management on the property. You know, they help with water and fencing and even checking on the herd. Um, through CSU has also provided a lot of support for the herd, but really moving forward, uh, we rely on donations a lot to keep. Um, keep the herd going from a sense of our ability to be able to continue to maintain the area for them and to check on them and to provide veterinary care if it's needed to help um, make transfers of bison possible to other places so we give away bison instead of sell them and so donations to the herd allow us to do that and to give them to partners um, you know without them incurring great costs and instead on their end also they can take the money they would have used to pay for bison to help support and make the animal keep the animals kind of you know healthy in their space and in their land so um, that is all supported by donation and anyone can contribute we are we are incredibly grateful for any contributions and that can be done online. So you can go to advancing.colostate.edu um, and there's a link slash bison, sorry, advancing.colostate.edu slash bison. That is the link that you can use to donate. Um, and I'll share that on the screen here um, at the end of the presentation. And you know, anything helps, $5, $2, whatever you can give, it helps us um, keep the animals safe and healthy and helps us get them out to new homes as well. Before we jump over to that, let's just do one last question, sure. which is what's the future of this project? What's coming up next for you? So I think for us, we are really focusing on helping to support other communities um, to obtain some of our animals. 
they are growing well in the space that we have. Um, you know, I, I get asked about the growth of the herd. Are we going to expand? And that's really just going to depend on, um, you know, decisions that are made at the city and the county level for the land and how it's used and, and how we can work with the partners on the ground. I mean, there are ranching families up there and we want to be able to work in partnership with them and to develop really innovative strategies to support both agriculture and conservation on the landscape there in northern Colorado. So that's really important to me. Um, and I think it's really important to our partners as well. Well, of course, they could probably they would probably speak to that uh, from their perspectives. But just looking for ways to continue to manage the animals, you know, healthily on the land and and, and to do that. So and to, of course to continue to improve our reproductive technologies on the science side as well to make that process more efficient. Um, so yeah. Perfect. Do you want to show? Yes, let me show you. Let me give you the link uh, here. This is, if you want to donate, the advancing.colostate.edu slash bison. And I also want to say that our five-year anniversary is officially next month. So November 1st was five years. We're going to have a series of online events uh, that will be announced through our Facebook page, and you can see that on the slide there as well. You can follow us there. We're going to post um, some information about some upcoming activities on November 7th, which is National Bison Day. And also on November 8th, we are going to have um, a self-guided tour and a scavenger hunt for children up at Soapstone Prairie Natural Area where some of us who've been involved with um, helping establish the herd out there will be there to answer your questions and in the evening we're going to have some educational talks that you can uh, link into kind of like you did for this today. So uh, stay tuned we have a lot of also community partners that we're going to announce for exciting things that are happening around the five-year anniversary and um, yeah you, you can learn about that through Facebook as well. So, you have a closing script that you need to read or not? Um, yes, I do. So, let's see here. Okay. So to close out the session today, um, I just want to say thank you, of course. Thank you to you all for tuning into this session, and um, I want to thank, of course, all of the authors and other contributors to the program over the weekend. Um, you can join again next Friday for another three days of workshops, readings, and discussions. Um, and if you'd like to purchase any of the BookFest author's books, you can go to um, www.oldfirehousebooks.com slash BookFest2020. Um, book plates available from select authors. Please indicate in the comments section of your order if you're interested in a signed copy. And finally, if you want to check out the schedule, please go to the BookFest website, which is www.focobookfest.org. Um, and also there's a survey, they'd be really grateful if you would fill out um, and that input allows them to plan for future events that you want to see. So thank you very much. Have a great Sunday. And, and Peggy just mentioned something thanks about for joining Golden us. Bison Beer from Odell Brewing Company. Yes, yeah. I was wondering if I could talk yeah, about please. that. <laughs> yeah, that's, it doesn't get more Colorado than that, right? Great, so. yes. So one of the, the uh, exciting partnerships is with Odell Brewing Company. They're brewing us a Golden Bison Brew, and that will be available in November. We will be in touch about dates and times for all of that. It's really exciting, and we're really grateful to Odell for doing it. So stay tuned for that. And yeah, like you said, what could be more Fort Collins than beer and now bison, right? <laughs>